Greetings and salutations, and welcome back to another episode of Everything Astronomy. My name is Talon, and I will be co-hosting an episode for the first time because today we are joined by a very special guest who is not in the field of astronomy or physics, but rather biology. Michael Imperiale is the Arthur F. Thurnau Professor of Microbiology and Immunology and the Associate Vice President for Research at the University of Michigan. He completed his undergraduate and graduate studies at Columbia University, earning his PhD in biological sciences in 1981. He first began working at U of M in 1984 as an assistant professor before working his way up to his current position. His research focuses on interactions between human polyomavirus BKPYV and host cells, and he has served on various committees looking at biosecurity. Professor Imperiale, thank you very much for joining us. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, thanks very much for having me. Happy to have you. So. Let's get right into it. How did you initially become interested in biology and more specifically microbiology? Yeah, so um, the way I became interested in biology was when I took my first biology class in, in college. Um, but let me preface that by saying, I, I, I think I've always been interested in science and te technology, even when I was a, a little kid. I remember watching the you know, space program when it was first started, you know, the Mercury and Gemini and Apollo missions. I remember watching like every launch and just being fascinated um, by, by, by that. But anyway, yeah, so when, when I took introductory, introductory biology in college, um, I remember the first class, the professor getting up there and just describing how cells function, you know, at a, at a very high level, right? And, and I was just really fascinated by how, how could this be, right? How can you know, something that's a bunch of, you know, proteins and chemicals, you know, become living. And, and that's mm -hmm. what really got me interested in biology. And, and then with respect to, to microbiology, that's sort of later in my career when um, I really became interested in how um, the expression of genes could be regulated, how that was controlled. And at that time, when, when I was um, starting my postdoctoral studies, um, Microbes were really the only um, tractable experimental systems to study uh, genes in, and, and so that's how I got into microbiology. All right, for that for that initial biology class you took, did you going into college? Did you kind of have an idea that you wanted to go more down the life science or natural science, or did you just take the biology class on a whim? Yeah, no. So when I started um, college, I, I wanted to be a dentist. Um, I had an uncle who was a dentist and uh, who was really one of my, you know, heroes. And um, he didn't have any children of his own. And he always hoped that one of his nephews would take over his um, practice. And of course, you know, back then, right, things were very sort of sexist. He would have never thought, you know, maybe one of his nieces, you know, right. should take over um, his practice. But anyway, um, so yeah, I thought, you know, I, I wanted to become a dentist um, when I started college. And, and that's you know, why I took biology, because I was taking that sort of pre-dental, you know, program. Right. So uh, what initially got you focused on entering academia as opposed to continuing on a path like that or any sort of medical path? Yeah. So, um, so again, you know, I just got so interested in biology that I decided to do some research. And once I started doing some research, um, that's when I made the decision that I wanted to go to graduate school rather than go to dental school. Um, it, in retrospect, if someone had told me you can be a dentist and do research at the same time, <laughs> I, I may have done that, you know, right? But because obviously like here at the University of Michigan, right? In the dental school, we have, you know, dentists who, who do research, but nobody ever told me that. So, um, it, you know, the choice was to do research or dentistry. And, and I just was more excited about research at that time. So for that initial research you did going into grad school, do you kind of like outline exactly what that research was? And because um, I know you you mentioned genomes. And so like what exactly were you looking for in these initial microbes? Oh, yeah. So the, the research I did as an undergraduate was actually not about microbes. So um, it was um, trying to study um, eukaryotic cells in culture. And we were interested in how a particular gene um, called G6PD, so glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, was regulated in cells. And the reason for studying that particular gene was that um, there were good tools to be able to do selection for expression or against expression of that gene. So you could really 
manipulated. And, and so, you know, that's what, you know, got me interested in, in, in gene expression. And so, um, yeah, we were growing these cells in culture and trying to understand, you know, what, if we could start figuring out what controls the expression of that gene. Um, this was in the very earliest days of, of molecular biology. And so we still, we, re, we didn't really have molecular tools to study genes um, back then when I was an undergraduate, but it was more using sort of more classical genetic types of approaches. So trying to mutate cells, um, taking two cells that have different phenotypes and fusing them together and asking which phenotype is dominant, which is recessive. Um, mm -hmm. Those are the kinds of experiments we were doing back then. It really is fascinating how in such a short period of time since then, our tools for studying genes are so much more advanced now. Like it, just the explosion of molecular biology in the past you know, 40, 50 years, just everything we know now versus what we knew then is just astounding to me. It, it so. really is remarkable how the technology has advanced. And, you know, you know, we hear about Moore's law for computing, right? And how, you know, um, the capacity of, of chips, you know, increases, you know, but, but I think there's been a similar exponential sort of growth in, in biology too. I agree, yeah. Um, Bouncing off the research conversation from before, I mentioned that you study polyomaviruses now. What does your research now exactly involve? Sure. So, um, so the virus that you mentioned, BK polyomavirus. So the, the name BK uh, actually comes from the initials of the patient from whom this virus was first isolated back in 1971. So um, uh, I'm just going to call it BK virus because it's just easier to... to, to right. Um, so, so BK virus um, infects the vast majority of the human population. So if you look at um, uh, serology, so the presence of antibodies against the virus, which is an indication that people have been infected with the virus, at least 80 or 90% of us um, are, ha have been infected with BK virus. Um, we don't know whether the virus causes any disease when we first get exposed to it. And we also don't even really know how we get exposed to it. So those are two big unanswered questions. But what we know is that once you are infected, it goes to your urinary tract and it persists there for the remainder of your life. And the way that we know it persists is periodically um, you can detect the virus in the urine. Okay, so every once in a while the virus is replicating and being excreted into urine. But as long as your immune system is healthy, it doesn't cause any disease. So you can almost think of it as it's sort of just, you know, going along for the ride in, in humans and every once in a while replicating and finding a way to spread. Um, but in immunocompromised individuals, and in particular in transplant patients, if the virus starts to replicate, it can cause very severe disease. So in kidney transplant patients, the virus can start replicating in the graft in the transplanted kidney and destroy the graft. So that's a big problem, obviously. And then in um, people who get bone marrow transplants, the virus can replicate in the bladder and um, it causes a disease that's called hemorrhagic cystitis. So hemorrhagic, there's a lot of bleeding. Right. Um, cystitis is a bladder infection. It could be very painful. Um, you could have significant blood loss to where these individuals have to get transfusions. Um, and, and you can also get clotting, which would cause, you know, the urine to back up and that could lead to secondary problems. And, and, and you know, as you, as you probably know, um, a lot of bone marrow transplant patients are little kids who are being treated for cancer. So imagine, you know, you, you have cancer and they're being treated for cancer. And now, you know, you, you, go to, you go to urinate and it's bloody and it hurts. So it's really, you know, kind of a, a very morbid sort of situation. And, and the problem that we have is that there are no antiviral drugs to, to treat these patients with. And so um, in, in the bone marrow transplant patients, what they do is just palliative care, right? Try to, again, replace significant blood, blood loss, um, deal with the pain, uh, you know, keep, keep the urine flowing. In, in the bone marrow, I'm sorry, in the kidney transplant setting, what they do is they monitor for the presence of virus in the blood, because once the virus is replicating in the kidney, it has access to the blood. Um, and, and so if they start to see the virus increasing in the blood, what they'll do is to back off on the immunosuppressive drugs to prevent rejection with the hope that, 
Now, if you let the immune system kind of function a little bit, it will clear the virus infection. But of course, if you let the immune system function, it can also reject the, the transplant. And so a large number of these patients who um, have BK infection in their transplanted kidney have to get a second uh, transplant uh, because of either rejection or destruction by the virus. And, and so um, for many years, we studied how the virus replicates. Um, so we developed a, a cell culture model for replication of the virus that mimics what the virus sees in, in the kidney. And, and we've learned a lot you know, using that system about some of the viral uh, factors that are important for replication, and also some of the cellular factors that either the virus takes advantage of or that sort of work against um, viral infection. So we, we've learned a lot there. Most recently, we've been sort of shifting our emphasis and trying to learn more about how the virus persists without replicating. And, and again, it's just in the past couple of years where we've been able to develop a, a, a slightly different cell culture model for studying persistence of the virus. And so now we're in a position to really learn more about um, that. And, and we know a little bit now about some of the viral factors that um, contribute to persistence. And we want to obviously learn more about what some of the cellular factors are because um, you know, vi viruses are dependent on the cell for replication. And so mm -hmm. um, there's always going to be some cellular factors that the virus either has to take advantage of or fight against in, in order to do what it wants to do. And so you know, our, our hope is if we can, you know, learn enough about this, you know, and this is, you know, kind of in an ideal world, right, that that may point the way towards, you know, better therapeutic approaches um, for the virus. One of the reasons that we don't have um, good uh, therapies right now is that polyomaviruses um, only encode one known enzyme that's involved in replication of the viral genome. And so they mostly depend on the cellular um, so th these viruses have a DNA um, genome. And so they use all of the cells, DNA uh, polymerases and such to replicate their genomes. And so you can't make a drug that targets um, specifically virus replication because it's going to kill the cell potentially. And so we're hoping if we can find something that's unique about the virus that the cell, you know, doesn't have to depend on, that could be a potential, you know, target for um, coming up with a, a new therapeutic or something like that. And so unfortunately, unfortunately or fortunately, it depends on how you look at it, we, we have to use, rely on cell culture models to learn as much as we can, because it would be unethical for us to do experiments on humans. We can't just, and everybody's infected already anyway, so we can't take people and infect them and see what happens. Right. And, and secondly, there are no good animal model systems um, to study BK virus because polyomaviruses are very species specific. So human polyomaviruses only replicate in humans. Mouse polyomaviruses only replicate in mice. And so we can't just take the human virus and infect mice, for example, and um, see what happens there. It's really fascinating. I hadn't heard of that virus before, but it's crazy that so many of us have it and don't even know it. Yeah, so um, you know, a lot of times I'll start a lecture on the virus and say, how many people in the room are you know, infected with BK? And, and no one will raise their hands. <laughs> <laughs> no, one, no, one's heard of it. no one knows about it and then everybody's surprised when, right yeah so uh you mentioned that uh we're not really sure how it initially infects humans are there any outstanding or popular theories as to where exactly it comes from like is it possible that it's uh transmitted from mother to child as part of a microbiome or anything like that yeah, so it's probably not mother to child. So as I mentioned, it can be um, found in urine. So there's the potential that it could be spread by exposure to urine. Um, but there's also some evidence that it can replicate in salivary glands. And so that would, you know, potentially allow for some sort of respiratory spread. You know, most um, people become infected at a very, in, in very early childhood. So by like the age of five or six or seven. And so the epidemiology kind of points more towards a respiratory, you know, exposure. Um, and, and also, I, I think most people would think that if it were really being transmitted through urine, um, that in the developed world, you shouldn't have as much transmission as you have, for example, in the third world where sanitation isn't as good, right? Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, other people have argued to me, you know, kids, you know, are just messy and, and uh, you know. Right. 
And did studying the uh, the BK virus is that was that kind of your stepping stone to go work on biosecurity committees, or was that um, you know something else that um, motivated you to work on biosecurity committees? And what does working on a biosecurity committee exactly entail? Yeah, so the way I got involved in biosecurity was completely serendipitous. Um, so back in 2000, I think it was, um, I was appointed as the chair of a committee here at, at U of M called the Institutional Biosafety Committee. So at, at that time, the, the role of that committee was to um, uh, sort of, I don't wanna say regulate, but review um, research involving recombinant DNA. So, and, and so, Mm -hmm. um, you know, institutions are required by the U.S. government to review any recombinant DNA research. And so I was appointed as chair of that committee. And then um, there was rumor um, after the 9-11 attacks, there was the um, incidents where uh, someone mailed anthrax spores to various right. people. And, and so there was sort of a bioterrorism attack, right? Okay. And that led um, the National Academies to do a study on um, potential bioterrorist threats, right? And the study came out and basically um, said that the government needs to pay more attention to the fact that um, biological research that has legitimate purposes, the results of that research could potentially be misused by someone who wants right. to cause harm. And, and they call this the dual use dilemma, right? So you've got research that could be used for good, but it could also be used for harm. And one of the recommendations that came out of that study was that the government should put, put together an advisory panel um, you know, to, to provide advice to the government right. on this topic. Okay, so the second thing that was kind of serendipitous for me was in 2003, the chair of my department retired and I was appointed as interim chair of the department. And, um, there is a um, association of chairs of microbiology and immunology departments that has an annual meeting, you know, to talk about, you know, various things that are affecting the field, right? And um, the year that I was the um, interim chair, the meeting was in Hawaii. And so I thought, you know what? I'm gonna go to this meeting. <laughs> um, you know, there, there aren't right. many perks to being an interim chair because you kind of have a lot of the responsibility, but you don't get to do a lot of the cool things like hire new faculty and develop new programs. Right. So I went to this meeting in Hawaii and one of the speakers at this meeting um, had served on this National Academies Committee that wrote that report. And so he was a faculty member from um, the U University of Louisville in, in Kentucky. And so I was talking to him, you know, um, you know at, at the meeting and come to find out that at that time, his daughter was a student here. And so I thought, you know, I'm going to see if we can invite you up to Michigan. I went to the vice president for research at that time and asked him, you know, could we invite you? And so I organized this symposium on, on biosecurity. And I think that caught att the attention of the federal government when they were trying to put together this advisory panel. And so I got asked to be on this advisory panel, which was called the National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity. And so that's how kind of, it was just sort of serendipitous um, that I was in sort of two of the right places at the right time. I was chair of the biosafety committee. So I had access to the vice president for research here. And then I was interim chair of the department and, and uh, was at this you know, wonderful location in Hawaii and, and got to um, you know, connect with someone who, who is involved in this already. So, so that so really didn't have anything to do with my research per se because I don't BK is not what you consider a, a bioterrorism threat. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it really you know was just more that I was a virologist and, and I had an interest in in this topic. It's a very fortunate series of events to follow. Yeah, and, and it's really been fascinating. I mean, I've really enjoyed um, you know being involved in some of these discussions dealing with science policy. Um, getting to learn more about how the government works, how international entities work um, in, mm -hmm. in these areas. Um, and, and since that time, I've been involved in, in a number of other um, National Academy projects um, that, that deal with biosecurity. Very interesting. Um, let's uh, shift gears a little bit and talk about COVID-19, seeing as we're talking to a microbiologist in the midst of a global pandemic. 
So um, for people that, that may not understand yet at this point in the pandemic, how exactly does uh, the virus attack our cells yeah, and replicate? Uh, sure. So, um, so, so coronaviruses, um, which COVID, well, so thinking remembers that COVID-19 is the disease. The, the virus is called SARS coronavirus 2 or, or SARS CoV 2. So, um, coronaviruses um, are viruses that have an RNA genome. So, their genome is not DNA like BK virus that we've been talking about. It's an RNA genome. And um, they um, uh, are also what are called enveloped viruses. So, there, there are sort of, broadly speaking, two types of viruses. There are viruses that are just a nucleic acid and proteins that coat that nucleic acid that form what's called a capsid. Um, and those are called non and have their nucleic acid. They have the proteins that coat that nucleic acid to form the capsid. And then they also have a, a lipid envelope. So you can think of the lipid envelope as sort of the same as the plasma membrane of our cells. And in fact, that's where these viruses get their lipid envelope. They, they're derived from the plasma membrane of the cell as the virus is exiting the cell after it's done um, replicating. And, and so, yeah, the way that um, um, SARS-CoV-2 works is it has this protein that you've probably heard of called the spike protein. That's what gives coronaviruses their characteristic um, morphology, which are these sort of spikes sticking out of the outside of the virus that make it look like a, a crown. Um, and so the spike protein binds to specific receptors on the surface of the cell, and that allows the virus to infect those cells. And, and in this case, those receptors are found in cells in, in our respiratory tract. And, 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 and so that's what allows for SARS-CoV-2 to infect cells in our, in, in our respiratory tract and in our lungs. And it's when it gets, gets into the lungs that it can really cause um, severe disease. So the, the virus gets into those cells. Um, the, the RNA genome of the virus can act as a messenger RNA molecule. So it will get translated into proteins some of those proteins will replicate the viral genome to make new genomes. Other of those proteins become the new structural proteins, so the capsid proteins of the viruses. And viruses, unlike cells that grow and divide, right? viruses basically um, assemble their parts. So they make new parts and they assemble them together. And then the virus will then escape from the cell. And, and during that process, it's killing the cell. And so that's what... Um, you know, causes part of the pathology, but some of the pathology due to, um, you know, COVID-19 is also the immune response, recognizing those infected cells and trying to then destroy those infected cells to prevent the virus from being able to continue to replicate and, and, um, and spread. And so it's those, a combination of those things that, that lead to the disease. The reason, the reason that this particular virus has been so, um, sort of, you know, um, uh, um, pathogenic is that, um, number one, as I said, it, it can infect, you know, fairly deep into the lung and cause pneumonia, whereas most of the respiratory viruses that we get infected with, on, you know, on a regular basis don't do that, under, except under very special circumstances. And then number two, since the human population has never been exposed to this virus before, we don't have any pre-existing immunity. Um, and, and so that allows the virus to, you know, really do its thing. And, and you, you know, each of us who gets exposed to the virus has to mount a brand new immune response um, to that virus. So while we're on the topic of the basics of virology, uh, most scientific definitions would not describe viruses as technically being alive. Uh, there's a little bit of a debate that viruses may technically be living organisms, despite the fact that they can't reproduce without a host and they don't have a metabolism. Uh, but which side of the debate do you fall on and why? Yeah, okay. So you're really testing the pH in my PhD now, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I fall on the viruses are not alive side, but I, I think it really depends on how, to some degree on how you define life. Um, so, you know, uh, some definitions of life say that, you know, it has to be self-sustainable. And certainly viruses are not self-sustainable because they require a cell um, to reproduce, right? But other definitions say, you know, something that has the capability of, 
of, of reproducing it. And they do have the capability, they just have to be in the right in, environment. But I, 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 I guess I, I feel that, um, you know, for something to be called alive, it has to be able to reproduce on its own. Um, and, and so I, I think viruses are not alive. And so regardless of whether they classify as alive or not, obviously a lot of viruses are going to be harmful to humans and other animals and creatures. And so, you know, obviously we're gonna develop vaccines to prevent these viruses from hurting us. And so a lot of people may know that the, the COVID vaccines are mRNA, but not necessarily know exactly what that means. So how does an mRNA vaccine work and how does it differ from um, other types of vaccines that are available? Sure, and, 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 and you know, let me just preface this by saying that, yeah, you know, the, the two first vaccines that came out, the Pfizer and the um, Moderna are both mRNA vaccines, but some of the other vaccines are not. And maybe we can come back to that um, mm -hmm. you know, if you want later. So, so yeah, the way that mRNA vaccines work is um, basically the, the vaccine itself is a, is, a, is a messenger RNA molecule that is um, complexed with um, a, a, nanoparticle, a nanoparticle, which is a, a lipid nanoparticle. And what the, what the nanoparticle does is it basically delivers the RNA into the cell. So um, the RNA gets into the cell and, and in, the, in the case of the coronavirus of the COVID vaccine, the mRNA gets translated to make this spike protein, okay? So you get an immune response against the spike protein. And in particular, you can get antibodies against the spike protein that when they bind to the spike protein, now the spike protein cannot interact with these receptors on the cell. So mm -hmm. it prevents the virus from, from infecting the cell. And obviously then if the virus can't infect the cell, it can't replicate and, and cause disease. And so that's the main way that these mRNA um, vaccines work. Now you also do get um, what's called a cell mediated immune response against the spike protein that allow, so that, and, and what that allows is if the virus does happen to get into a cell and start replicating, now the immune response can can um, recognize that infected cell and eliminate that infected cell. But, but in general, um, these, these um, mRNA vaccines are better at um, producing an antibody response than at producing the cell mediated um, response. And, and so that's how these, these vaccines work. And, and I have to tell you, you know, it's really remarkable to me how well um, they're, they're working. Um, in, in general, you know, um, well, I, shouldn't, I guess I shouldn't say that. It, it, depends on what you, it, it depends on what the goal of vaccination is. If the goal is to really provide um, these sort of neutralizing antibody response, that's what these antibodies are called that prevent mm -hmm. infection, then this type of vaccine is great. And, and it seems to be working here. I shouldn't say it seems to be working, it's working. Right. It's working very well so far. Um, so how exactly did mRNA vaccines come about? Is this something that's uh, been an idea for a very long time? And it just kind of coincided with this pandemic that we're finally getting it down? Because as far as I'm aware, this is the first uh, widely available mRNA yeah, so, vaccine. So mRNA vaccines really sort of grew up out of the field of gene therapy. So, um, you know, gene therapy is, is basically the use of genes to correct, um, you know, um, or genetic defects or to cure diseases, right, by delivering genes. And there are different ways to deliver genes into cells. And again, delivering an mRNA molecule is one way to um, deliver genes. But, it, but it, was, it, was, it became clear to people that, you know, if you could deliver genes for therapeutic purposes, you can also um, deliver genes for vaccination purposes. And so mRNA vaccines have been under development probably for about um, a decade. I know that during the um, last wow. Ebola outbreak, people were looking at mRNA vaccines for Ebola. And so, yeah, I think, you know, um, we were at the point where the um, development of these vaccines had reached the stage where applying them to SARS-CoV-2 was pretty, in retrospect, not straightforward. Um, but, but even still, you know, if you would have asked me last summer or even early last fall, you know, would we be where we're at today um, in terms of vaccination? Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think I would have said that. I, I think I would have said, you know, we'd probably be at this point this coming summer. 
you know, or, or late summer. So um, right. it's, re it's really great the way that these things have come about. And, and you know, it's really just a testament to, um, you know, sort of all the, you know, very basic science that went into understanding how, you know, the immune system functions, how you can, you know, deliver genes into cells, those sorts of things that, that really um, allowed this to all just kind of come together. And then obviously, you know, um, a big investment by the government really helped to, to right. move things forward quickly too. Uh, given that uh, surprising success that we're seeing uh, with these mRNA vaccines, do you think that uh, mRNA vaccines are something we'll start kind of shifting toward in the future for other viruses? Or do you think we'll continue to uh, have a large amount of vaccines that utilize killed or weakened viruses? Yeah, I, I think that's probably going to depend on the application. You know, so these mRNA vaccines turned out to work quite well um, against uh, SARS-CoV-2, but it, it may be against other viruses, they won't work as well. And so you may need to use other, you know, technologies. And, and so I think I think for any you know given um, application, we're going to have to pursue multiple avenues and, and see which of the approaches works best. Because again, um, as I alluded to earlier, different types of vaccines stimulate different parts of the immune system better or, or less well, and, and it's really going to depend on which arm of the immune system you know you really need to get uh, immunity against a, a, a given pathogen, be it a virus or a bacterium or a parasite, whatever it is. And so I, I, it's like you mentioned um, before we started talking about uh, the, the mRNA vaccines. I didn't, I wasn't aware that um, different companies had made different types of vaccines that didn't utilize mRNA. Um, do you care to outline like specifically um, maybe which company and what type of vaccine they're using and how it differs from an mRNA vaccine? Sure. So, um, so there's a few. So first there's a, uh, there's the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which just got emergency use authorization recently from the, from the FDA. So that's an interesting vaccine. So it's, it's what's called a virally vectored, vectored vaccine. So I have to say that five times fast. <laughs> so, um, so what they did there was they took a, a, another respiratory virus that's called the adenovirus, and they um, engineered the adenovirus so it cannot cause disease, right? But, and then what they do is they take the same gene encoding the coronavirus spike protein and engineer it into the virus. So in effect, it's using adenovirus just as a delivery tool to get the coronavirus gene into the cell. So it's, it's almost the same concept as using, you know, these lipid nanoparticles to get an mRNA into the cell, except now you're using basically a, a virus as a delivery mm -hmm. tool. And so the adenovirus delivers its... This, this engineered adenovirus delivers its genome, which can produce now the coronavirus spike protein into the cell. The coronavirus spike protein gets synthesized and then the immune system recognizes it um, in, in the same way. So the, that's the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. You've probably heard about the AstraZeneca vaccine, which isn't being used here yet, but it's being used in Europe. It is also an adenovirus-based vaccine, although it's a different um, adenovirus. So there are many different um, adenoviruses. So they just engineered a different one to do to do exactly the same thing. Right. So especially in a case like this, where we're trying new things, uh, we've got so many different types of vaccines for this disease. How do we safely conduct trials for the vaccines? Yeah. So, you know, um, the, the, the way that, that um, trials work is, is sort of a a three-step process in general, although you know sometimes the steps can be combined depending on, on the details. But the, the first step of any trial is a safety trial. So it's a, a very small number of um, participants. And, and what they'll do is they'll, they'll do sort of a little bit of a dose ex escalation. So based on what they know from preclinical um, experiments that were done in animals, um, they'll, they'll decide, okay, here's a dose that should be safe in humans. And they'll deliver that dose to people and basically look for safety, look to see if they're having any side effects, right? And so, right. you know, as a, as a secondary, um, you know, outcome, they may be able to tell whether it protects against disease or not, but really the, the goal of these phase one studies is safety. If it look, once they determine sort of what's the you know, best dose that they could give and still be safe and still get 
a good immune response in this case, then they'll expand that to a larger group of individuals, right? And again, to see now both, number one, is it safe in, in a larger population, but now are you getting some kind of efficacy? And, and mm -hmm. those are the trials that, that led to the approval of, of the vaccines that we have now. So it's a, it's a very regimented sort of approach that's dictated by the FDA. Um, and, and, you know, there are very specific endpoints that have to be measured. Um, you know, in, in this case, the, the endpoint was lack of severe disease. Um, and so, um, you know, that's what we So, you know, when you hear these numbers about efficacy, you have to make sure you understand what they mean by efficacy here. So efficacy doesn't mean people aren't getting infected uh, with uh, SARS-CoV-2 at mm -hmm. all. What it means here is protecting against severe disease. Right. Let's uh, shift gears a little bit here and go towards uh, the origins of COVID because that's something that's still not entirely clear to us for whatever reason. Uh, the popular story initially involved a wet market in Wuhan, but that seems to have mostly been dismissed. There are uh, a lot of dare I say, conspiracy theories that say that COVID was synthesized in a lab somewhere in China. And most of these theories are obviously very unscientific, uh, have no evidence to back them up and are often just sort of an easy way to blame China for the disease. Um, but there is one theory that kind of goes along those lines that I thought was interesting that I heard from an evolutionary biologist by the name of Brett Weinstein, who uh, did his graduate studies here at the University of Michigan. And he notes a few interesting things about the virus. Um, one of these is that there's a biosafety lab level four that studies bat coronaviruses in Wuhan. And this is one of two labs like it in the world. Uh, the horseshoe bats that carry similar virus do not live in Wuhan. Uh, the virus was immediately capable of human to human transmission, transmission which is not generally found in a disease that jumps from an animal to a human. Uh, there is a furin site on the virus's spike proteins that's generally not found among beta coronaviruses and it almost appears as if it's been spliced into the genome. Uh, the virus is very transmissible indoors and at least initially was not so much outdoors, uh, which suggests that the virus may have adapted to a lab environment. And finally, the receptor binding motif, which is very important for the virus to bind to a host cell, seems to most closely resemble that of a pangolin coronavirus, whereas the rest of the genome resembles that of a bat coronavirus. Uh, so all that being said, it seems uh, reasonable to entertain the idea that there may have been studies going on in that lab regarding gain of function mutations, uh, and they, they have they may have composited two viruses from a bat and a pangolin. The virus may have inadvertently escaped from the lab with, without malicious intent, may have just been on somebody still after they were doing their work. Um, do you think that theories such as that carry any weight or do you believe that the virus entered humans naturally? So I, I'm convinced that it entered humans naturally. Um, so I, I, I can I speak to a few of the things that, that you mentioned, but I, I can tell you that there's a group at Johns Hopkins. Um, they have a, a, a center there called the Center for Health Security. And then when these conspiracy theories about you know, this being an engineered virus um, came out, they, they published um, a very thorough debunking of, of that theory. And I'd be happy to, to, to share that with you, with you guys if, if you want to see that. But, but let me just speak to a, a few of these things. So first of all, mm -hmm. The idea that it spreads better indoors than outdoors, any virus spreads better indoors than outdoors, because when you're outside, the air currents are keeping things moving along. So it's less likely that something that comes out of my respiratory tract is going to make it into your respiratory tract or, or linger in the air just because there's better circulation. So that, that's not a good um, um, you know, reason. Um, mm -hmm. The, um, let me think, what else? The, the, the thing about things being spliced together, um, that's been, you know, again, thoroughly um, shown not to be the case. Um, the genetics of the virus. So if you look at the sequence of the virus and what it's most closely related to, it is most closely related to um, animal viruses. Um, and, and so, yeah, we haven't found, you know, the smoking gun that this is the animal that this virus definitely came out of. 
Mm -hmm. um, but but that may just require more detective work. And this might get to what, what you also mentioned, which is that, you know, um, it may not have come out of those markets in, in Wuhan originally. And so we, we, we need more work to figure out exactly where people were first um, exposed. And then, the, you know, the issue of whether of how it you know immediately became transmissible from human to human. Influenza viruses do that all the time, so that's not unheard of. So um, you know, I, I think that um, a lot of these uh, you know kind of theories just are, are more of a lack of understanding of um, virology. To to be honest with you. So even in cases where a virus. Like you mentioned, it's common among influenza viruses to immediately be able to jump human to human. Is that uh, still common when the virus was initially uh, an animal virus and then it infects a human? Is it normal for it to immediately become transmissible from human to human? I don't know if I would call it normal, but but I don't know if you remember the 2009 uh, influenza um, pandemic, but that was a virus yes. that jumped from pig to human and then started mm -hmm. spreading from human to human. Um, and so, you know, uh, viruses are, are constantly testing, you know, these so-called zoonotic viruses that, that you know, infect animals. They're, mm -hmm. they're constantly testing the human population. And most of the time it fails, right? The, the, individual, the first person doesn't even get sick. Sometimes only the people who are exposed to the animal get sick, right? But, right. but rarely you do get events like this where a person gets sick and they can then spread it. Um, to to another person, and that's how you end up with a, with a pandemic like this. I, I will say this, um, you know, I, I think it's plausible that there was an inadvertent escape from the lab in Wuhan, um, but but that was not an engineered. It was not an engineered virus that escaped. It was a, a natural virus that 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 lab was studying. It was studying a number of different viruses, um, and it's possible. That, that one of them escaped. But uh, again, all of the genetic evidence that I'm aware of, and I've spoken to various you know, leaders in the field of viral genetics, and, and they all think that it's, it's a natural, you know, it didn't come out of a lab, it came from a, a natural exposure. And it's so, rare, but it's, and it's gonna happen more as, you know, as, as population grows, as you know, man, man, uh, mankind kind of impinges on the natural environment and there's more opportunities for interactions with various animals, mm -hmm. um, you know, this is going to become. Remember, we had the first SARS um, back in the early 2000s. We had MERS mm -hmm. about 10 years ago. Now we've got this third coronavirus entering the population. Um, right. You know, and that first SARS was able to spread from human to human. Um, so, but we had good public health measures, and we were, we were able to blunt that one um, mm -hmm. right away. Whereas in this case here, things got out of control before we were able to. Um, blunt the spread. Right. And I'm sure at some point in the future, we will get down to the bottom of exactly where COVID-19 originated from. Um, but considering there's a lab in Wuhan, I kind of wanted you to outline like what the different bio level safety uh, like regulations are for and like how, how they are assigned to different labs. And then also kind of a two part or how likely is it um, that something really nasty might escape one of the, the higher level labs. Yeah, that's that's a great question. So so the difference so there are four biosafety levels, and it all um, really depends on on what's called the the risk group of the um, pathogen that's being um, studied. And and the risk group is a function of you know how how well how well does it spread, how severe is the disease that it causes, and are there any medical inter interventions for that disease. Okay, so um, so the, the types of um, viruses that get studied at, at BSL-4, which is the highest level of containment, and I'll talk a little bit about these levels of containment and it's sort of what's involved there, mm -hmm. are, are things like Ebola, right? right. And now, and now SARS-CoV-2, right? Where, um, although SARS-CoV-2 can actually be studied at BSL-3, um, so um, which is the next level down. And then there's BSL-2, BSL-1. So for example, BK that we study, it's a BSL-2, level pathogen. So it means it can mm -hmm. cause disease, but, you know, um, not, um, you know, only in special circumstances, in this case, in immunocompromised individuals. Mm -hmm. So BSL-1 are basically just sort of your, your average laboratory that you would find here at the, the University of Michigan. So, you know, you have to follow 
sort of, you know, sort of standard protocols to you know protect yourself against exposure, uh, but they're generally you know things that are not going to um, you know in in, in in a healthy human. BSL two, which is the next level level up, does require um, sort of more precautions. So, for example, with we have to um, use what's called the biosafety cabinet when we're working with the virus. So, what this is is it's a um, it's a it's, it's 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 kind of like a cabinet um, where um, there's negative pressure. So, in other words, there's never any air blowing out from inside this cabinet into your face. Air is only being drawn in, and then the exhaust goes through a filter before it gets exhausted, so that no um, pathogens can escape um, that that um, level. BSL three sort of a, another level up, where the not only is the biosafety cabinet required, but the facility itself um, is completely this negative pressure, so nothing can blow out. Um, there's sort of in order to get into it, you have to go through two doors, so sort of an interlocked door system where, again, to ensure nothing's getting out. And then the facility itself has specially, a special filtration um, condition so that if something were to inadvertently get out of the biosafety cabinet, it would get caught by those filters. And again, there's more strict procedures as to what you can do there. And in a BSL-3, um, everything has to be autoclaved before it gets brought out of the facility. So, so nothing alive comes out of there, except under very special conditions and it has to be under, you know, special containment and, and, and to prevent right. it from potentially leaking. BSL-4 is the kind of things you've probably seen in, in movies, you know, where people are wearing these spacesuits and they're connected to, you know, special air hoses and everything like that. Um, very, very specific training and protocols. Um, things have to be done very um, exactly. Um, and, 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 and so... You know, the, the chances of an accident in, in, in that type of facility is incredibly low, incredibly low because of the, the, the sort of engineering controls, you know, all the bells and whistles and everything like that. Um, and, and then the, um, you know, procedures um, that, are, that are done are, are, are very, very carefully vetted and, 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 and sort of um, scrutinized to make sure that no one's going to you know, potentially get exposed because obviously you're working with a very deadly pathogen, you know, you don't want to right. um, expose there. So, so that's the way that the different biosafety levels um, work. So you, uh, you mentioned a moment ago, obviously we've had the first SARS, we've had MERS recently, but we had solid uh, safety protocols in place and none of those spread to the level that COVID-19 has. Obviously, this country has not done a very good job of containing this disease, and we have some of the worst numbers in the world. What do you think that we should have done differently once we first realized that COVID-19 was a threat so that we wouldn't be in the position that we are now? Yeah. So I, I think it actually precedes once we realized there was a threat. I think we could have been better prepared for a pandemic. Um, you know, um, various advisory groups to the government, various national academies, studies have, have been saying for many years now that we are not prepared for a pandemic. And, and part of this comes out of the biosecurity um, field because the same things that you would use to prepare for a potential bioterrorism attack are the kinds mm -hmm. of things that you could use to prepare for a natural pandemic. You know, we, we, you know, we, we like to say, you know, nature you know, is, can be the worst bioterrorist. You know, and so so being prepared for one allows you to be prepared for the other. So we weren't we weren't prepared, um, despite there being a lot of warning. And and you know uh, I've come to learn over the years that this is just the way the U.S. government works. Um, <laughs> they like to be reactive mm -hmm. rather than yeah. proactive. Um, and and so you know it's it's just kind of the the nature of government to to some degree. Now once we knew about um, you know SARS coronavirus. Um, you know, we didn't do a good job in terms of being prepared to do testing. So there, you know, as you, you probably heard, there were issues, you know, with the CDC trying to develop a test um, that didn't go very well when they could have just taken the test that the WHO had developed and, and, and used that. So, so that didn't go very well. Um, and then, you know, once, you know, the virus came here, 
Um, certainly, um, you know, many individuals in the executive branch of the government downplayed, you know, the seriousness of the situation. Um, you know, we heard President Trump saying things like, you know, there's just going to be a couple of cases that's going to go away. You know, by Easter, this will all be done. It's a hoax. You know, that doesn't help, right? Because, right. And because it, it's not only the government that has to prepare, but the, the population has to prepare too. Right and, and be ready to to react and so, the, the, so then what happened is that I think you know we, we potentially if we had better testing in place if we really would have had a, a, a better admission that there was a problem here, then when we started to see cases we might have been able to do a better job of contact tracing and you know quarantining isolating people which is what worked for the first SARS um, outbreak. Right. So that's how we brought it under control was that we quarantined, we isolated and we prevented the spread. Um, now, the SARS-CoV-2 has a little bit spreads a little bit better. So it would have been a little bit harder to do even with SARS-CoV-2. And, and the other thing with SARS-CoV-2 is that asymptomatic people can spread, which mm -hmm. is a little bit different from. Um, and so contact tracing would have been a lot more difficult here. So I can't really fault the government. All, all that much on that. But I think it's just, we weren't prepared. And, and once we knew about it, we downplayed it. And, and that, didn't, that didn't really good, do any good. And then, you know, the other reason I think to, that we are, you know, kind of had, you know, what do we have? 5% of the population, 20% of the cases or something like that in the world is, is that, you know, we're not doing the very simple things that prevent the spread of this virus. Wearing masks, social distancing, washing hands. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and again, I, my view is that it's been a lack of leadership. Now, early on, right, we were saying don't wear masks. You know, even even you know, Dr. Fauci was saying don't wear masks, but that was because early on we had to make sure we had enough masks for our healthcare providers to be able right. to take care of the patients. Um, right. But but once it became clear that you know we could have enough masks to protect the population, then you know the word should have been very strong word should have gone out that people should wear masks to, 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 protect, to protect everyone. And we have, I think we all have a responsibility as a society to protect each other here. Mm -hmm. And that's really what masks do. And, you know, we know it from places where other countries where mask wearing, you know, worked, um, worked very well. And, and so right. I think that that was another place where we as a society kind of fell down um, in, in, in sort of somehow coming to the, you know, conclusion that being made to wear a mask is somehow, you know, um, interfering with my liberties. Um, and, and, and that, that makes no sense to me, you know. Um, you know, I argue that, you know, me being told I can't drive more than 70 on the interstate is interfering with my liberties, but we do it, right? All right, we sure. drive a little faster than that, but. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I have uh, some friends, I know, some friends. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, obviously, communication is going to be better for society at, at all levels. Um, you know, just communicating information better is going to, you know, benefit society as a whole. But is there anything we can do for, you know, detection or preventative methods that would have changed the effect of COVID-19 or possibly any um, viral pandemics in the future? Because I've heard um, some stories about, you know, people reporting like unofficial symptoms as early as like late October, early November. Um, so is there anything that we can do that will, you know, pick up on maybe these things sooner before they become, you know, more well known? Um, so I, I think there are a couple of things. I think, you know, certainly we could, you know, do more surveillance of what viruses are kind of out there. And, and there have been, you know, a number of efforts to, to do that. To, and, and, you know, that's one of the things that this lab in Wuhan was trying to do, right? Basically, mm -hmm get a sense for what, how many viruses are out there in bats or other animals and, you know, what are their properties, right? So that we, maybe we could predict which ones right. are more likely to make that jump in, into humans and, and be successful. So I think that sort of surveillance um, would be better. And then, you know, the other thing that we, we don't, um, w w that we can't do right now because we, we really don't have the, the technology is how do we, um, is there a way to easily screen for unknown viruses, right? Because right now, um, you know, we can't just do some sort of, you know, laboratory test um, and, and ask, you know, are, are 
for all viruses that would be untenable. Um, and you know the way that you know this virus was was you know discovered right was basically taking samples from patients and growing the virus in the lab, and then figuring right. out what it was. And so that delays things a little bit. Um, you know, not not all that much. So so better detection, better surveillance would would really help. Um, and and certainly you know when when there's got to be more transparency too, right? I think right. you know, most people would agree that China wasn't completely transparent about what was going on there. And that may have given countries more time to be prepared um, you know, for what was coming. Mm -hmm. I don't know that if that's your question, but... No, it does. Thank you. I think that was a lot of really good information about COVID-19. Uh, I've kind of got to pander to the audience a little bit now, seeing as this is technically an astronomy podcast. So I'm going to try to kind of mesh your expertise with the kind of content that people are used to on this channel and talk about microbes in space a little bit. So uh, how do microbes handle a zero gravity environment in something like a spaceship or the International Space Station? Great. So I should mention, I do know a little bit about um, space because um, besides watching all those um, NASA missions when I was a kid. For, for about two and a half or three years, I, I served on a NASA committee called mm. the Planetary Protection Subcommittee, which advised NASA on um, just what the name of the subcommittee says, like if we're sending a spacecraft to another planet, like how do we make sure we're not contaminating that planet? Right. And then conversely, when if we're going to start bringing things back here, um, how do we make sure we're not, you know, bringing something back here? So, so I've I've, I've, thought, I've thought about these issues a bit. So, so um, you know, microbes can survive in a zero gravity environment. Microbes can survive in an amazing um, constellation of, of environments. And in fact, there have been studies showing, you know, um, that the um, there is a microbiome on the International Space Station. Um, there, there are bacteria, there are fungi, because the astronauts, right, that go up there, bring it with them, mm -hmm. um, you know, when, when, when they're going up there. Uh, so, so yeah, things can survive in, in a zero gravity um, environment, um, you know, as long as they've got what they need to grow, right? Oxygen and, and uh, light in some cases um, and, and nutrients, right? And so where, where do the, the nutrients come from? Well, you know, um, skin that sloughs off our bodies, right? Or food debris when the astronauts are eating, right? That might somehow start floating around, things like that. So, so all of that's, um, all that's possible. And what do you think about some early life theories that, um, you know, life in the in the early formation of Earth could have possibly come from, you know, some kind of comet that, you know, it was in cryogenesis and it was frozen out in the outer reaches of the solar system? Do you think, you know, or microorganisms living on asteroids is even a possibility, if, even if it, you know, may look extremely different from what we like see now? Yeah, so... You know, I, I think it's certainly a possibility. I think that, first of all, to think that, you know, life as it exists on Earth is the only way that life can exist, you know, may not be the case, right? There may be other ways for life to exist. But, you know, um, we do know that, for example, bacteria, some bacteria can form spores. And, mm -hmm. and spores are incredibly resistant to very harsh environmental conditions. Um, and so I could imagine that maybe, you know, a spore... Uh, under the right conditions could survive on, you know, an asteroid and, and that strikes the earth and somehow it also survives that massive nuclear explosion, <laughs> um, you know, when, when it strikes. Um, mm -hmm. And then somehow that, you know, leads to, uh, you know, the development of, of life on earth. I, I think that's certainly possible. I, I, I don't think viruses could survive, you um, you know, on an asteroid, you know, viruses are pretty sen more sensitive to harsh environments, you know, irradiation, mm -hmm. those kinds of things. I think that would be um, much, much less likely. I think it would have to be some sort of cellular form of life. Um, I, I suppose it's also possible that just, you know, nucleic acids or some sort of primordial nucleic acid precursor right. might be alive and then, you know, somehow eventually seed um, evolution uh, mm -hmm. on Earth. So I, I don't think it's out of the question. I, I think that um, it, it's hard to know, right? Because we really don't know exactly how life first evolved on Earth. Right. I mean, um, 
And, and, and so, but, but again, you know, the, the fact that microorganisms can um, survive under pretty, you know, harsh conditions um, says it, I think it's possible. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I don't believe this story that was in the news um, recently about this asteroid that some um, guy thinks was a spaceship. Um, I, I don't believe that, but. but um, right. Yeah, because I've seen a lot of uh, physics research that um, I think it's thymine um, is found pretty commonly on a lot of um, terrestrial objects in the solar system. Oh, I didn't know that. That's... Yeah. So there's a lot of uh, talk about life on Mars, obviously. Uh, do you think that Mars has a habitable, habitable climate for microorganisms or is it too barren for something like that? I think right now it does not, unless there's something below the surface that, that we don't know about. Um, so, I, I, but, but you know, who knows, you know, millions of years ago, whether there may have been life on Mars. Um, I, I think right now, most people would agree that in our solar system, the most likely places that you would find um, life are on a couple of the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. So mm -hmm. there's um, Europa, which is right. in Jupiter, and Enceladus, uh, mm -hmm. in Saturn, and, and because they have subsurface water, and right. some conditions there for life might be, um, you know, or what I should say is terrestrial-like life. <laughs> you know, are probably more um, available than, than on Mars. But, you know, if the rover um, starts drilling and, and taking cores and bringing things back that, you know, show some sort of evidence, I think that would be pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. I think that's all we have. Uh, that was a great conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks so much for asking me. I really enjoyed talking with you. And, um, uh, you know, if you have any more uh, questions down the line, you know, I'm happy to answer them for you or your, your podcast listeners. Uh, you know, just uh, shoot me an email and, and we can uh, get some questions answered too. Absolutely. Hey, everyone. Thank you for listening to this podcast episode. This is Michael. This is Sam. This is Tommy. And this is Joe. If you're listening to this on YouTube, make sure to like, subscribe, and share with your friends. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, make sure to leave a review. All of the show notes can be found either in the description below or on our website. Thank you again for listening, and we'll see you next week with more Everything Astronomy.